so for someone who has studied the british press very closely including for my uh, uh, masters dissertation when i was in the uk i was actually quite appalled by the guardian piece because uh, it kind of uh, it, it kind of uh, s- splintered into pieces at the mildest of checks uh, like you said it had it had you know forget about glaring they were laughable errors uh, and my little quibble though actually changes the game a little bit which is that these errors were corrected quietly yes. there were no notes made you know one of the most important things in the digital world and and uh, this is a world you inhabit dev and you know it better than me in fact you can enlighten us a little bit which is that when any digital uh, news organization uh, including india today makes a correction corrects a piece of information forget about spelling errors correct an important piece of information there's always a footnote yes. or an update now uri and balakot are very different from the kind of things that the guardian piece is is uh, suggesting that india carries out uri and balakot are being trumpeted from the rooftops those are those are being officially acknowledged the world would n- perhaps not have even known about them if the modi government had not announced them right but the 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 alleged assassination program of the research and analysis wing and uh, uh, you know and uh, you can ask me this after this uh, when i give you a bit of a nugget on this uh, uh dev is that is that on such issues obviously care has to be taken hello and welcome to the 90th episode of in our defense and uh, you know a big big thank you uh, to our listeners and viewers uh, in our defense so this week won an award uh, the best show in the news politics uh, category uh, at the india awards india audio awards uh, 2023 2024 uh, that's the trophy uh, for people watching us on youtube and uh, you know if you're listening to us uh, on spotify apple podcast you can whatsapp us hi on our number 8588966996 we'll just you know send a photo to you if you if you'd like that So congrats Shiv uh thanks. congratulations Dev and congratulations to all of our listeners and viewers yes. as well because uh they've been the ones who've uh, made in in our defense what it is yes and i think it's uh, what keeps us going so and an award is really a sweetener yeah. an affirmation of the work we're yeah. doing yeah and a big uh, thank you to everyone who works behind the camera yeah it's not just dev and me yeah. yeah our producer anna the camera team the sound pr uh, the sound engineers it's like you know uh, great great help from them uh, we just come here once yeah. a week you know have our you know whatever one hour conversation chit chat and then just disappear to our respective yeah. they're, they're the engine of the show they are yeah. the ones who actually slack and do do everything then ensure the show is out on uh, a big thank you to everyone uh, the teams behind the camera the behind the mic uh, and uh, to our listeners and viewers uh, viewers once again we are very very thrilled uh, to have uh, gotten this card and this award uh right so this week uh, just like the last one the last episode we are going to discuss the intersection of politics and military uh, in the indian context and this is something that you know shiv had kind of uh, predicted last time as well that this is this will happen in the upcoming weeks uh, with the election season hotting up and uh, the rallies happening left right and center politicians saying whatever they have what they they do at such such events uh what we're going to talk about is this uh, dialogue not dialogue uh, the chant that's become quite popular of mm. late ghar mein ghus ke mara ghar mein ghus ke marenge prime minister has been saying it a lot uh, yeah, yeah. yeah the pm has been saying it uh, uh upcm yogi adityanath has been saying it amit shah has been saying it rajnath singh has been saying yeah. it yeah. Uh, and just before i came into the studio jay shankar as well uh, said something on on similar lines not exactly the phrase but something on the lines of you know the, this india does uh, the uri surgical strikes this india does the balakot test yeah. Yeah. Uh, why are they suddenly making this comment? They are making this comment. I mean, they would have anyway. Uh, election season, uh, but they are making this comment, uh, especially in the aftermath of a. I don't want to call it a report shift, but a Guardian news report, so to speak, uh, that came out on I think Sunday night, mm. if I'm not wrong. Uh, that report basically uh, cited uh, pakistani uh, documents uh, uh, had no names uh, every, every, everything was source based uh, and cited pakistani documents and pakistani source information to basically say that indian uh, 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 i'll repeat that to say that raw the indian spy agency was behind a string of mysterious killings that have happened in pakistan these killings are of terrorists yeah. the, uh, people that india considers terrorists 
and that this uh, this this these killings were done by a sleeper cell working out of the UAE, uh, operated by a raw agent over there, and they've been contracting and hiring like you know locals in Pakistan or like you know kind of forcing them to you know accept contracts and then you know getting them bumped off. Uh, we won't go much into the allegations uh, uh, per se because we have actually discussed that in the previous uh, episode of yeah. Inner Defense. I think one of the first few ones and one of our most watched most episodes watched, as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, the <clears throat> curious case of the missing uh, oh, sorry unknown gun. <laughs> <laughs> unknown gunmen, yeah. So we'll have a link to the to the yeah. episode in the show notes because when I was reading the Guardian report, I just thought that more or less what we discussed in that episode covers the allegations. Yeah. But I do want to still focus on the Guardian report for a bit before we move on to the other aspects of this of this episode. Uh, is just how shoddy it was because I remember reading the Financial Times report that. Uh, said that Indian agents uh, were involved in a plot uh, to assassinate uh, Gurparavan Singh Pannu in the, in the United States. Uh, that plot was uncovered by the FBI. Uh, charges had been filed against a few people uh, and uh, the report later on we learned that the US government identified a top level official in India, in Delhi, uh, with links to this alleged plot. Uh, India has taken those allegations very seriously. Uh, uh, they have told the US that a high level committee is investigating it we don't yet know what's happened but i think uh, the the gist that i'm getting is it's going to be said that it was the uh, workings of a rogue operative etc etc again don't want to get into that right now but i just want to compare the two the financial times report when i read as a journalist because i am from this industry i took it seriously because that report was solid i may have uh, disagreements or i may have questions but I, the report was solid when i read that guardian report on sunday night i was laughing at myself yeah. i was laughing at the report i was like what is this hmm. there were factual errors there were grammatical errors uh, there was a guy they incorrect claimed, pictures yeah incorrect pictures the guy they claimed was bumped off in pakistan but actually was somebody who was killed in, in an operation in, in india itself so before we go to into the uh, uh, the episode your take on the report and what do you make of the new controversy so so the the look the the guardian is a a widely respected, serious British newspaper, uh, uh, which has, uh, you know, a lot of protocols, a lot of ethical guidelines, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of the most rigorous uh, uh, style sheets of any newspaper in the world. Uh, the Guardian prides itself on uh, accuracy, you know, corroborating facts, etc. Uh, so f for someone who has studied the British press very closely, including for my... Uh, uh, master's dissertation when I was in the UK, I was actually quite appalled by the Guardian piece because uh, it kind of uh, it, it kind of uh, splintered into pieces at the mildest of checks. Uh, like you said, it had it had uh, you know forget about glaring; they, they were laughable errors. Uh, it's a it's a story about it's a story about uh, intelligence agents allegedly. Uh, you know, orchestrating an assassination program in a foreign country, uh, which is Pakistan in this case. Uh, you talk about Gurpatwan Singh uh, Pannu uh, being dead. Uh, you you have a picture of a guy called Riyaz Ahmed and claim him to be a, a Lashkar-e-Taiba terrorist who was killed in 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 Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in September last year, but was actually uh, a Kashmiri man who was arrested at the Delhi railway station this year in February. Uh, you've got other errors as well, which many experts on social media have dug out and posted. Uh, more than the look, you know, I, I'm willing to forgive even the errors. You know, as, as a journalist, errors will happen. Errors can creep in. You know, maybe there was a deadline. Maybe the editor wasn't there. Maybe Hannah, the journalist uh, uh, who wrote the piece, was uh, you know, uh, you know, wasn't having a great day. You uh, you know, any journalist can make any number of. Uh, um, you know, excuses for errors creeping into a larger piece. They can make the excuse saying that, you know, but these small errors don't change the larger tone and tonality of what is being said in the piece. <clears throat> uh, and my little quibble, though, actually changes the game a little bit, which is that these errors were corrected quietly. Yes. There were no notes made. You know, one of the most important things in the digital world, and, and uh, this is a world you inhabit, Dev, and you know it better than me. In fact, you can enlighten us a little bit, which is that, when any digital uh, news organization, uh, including India Today, makes a correction, corrects a piece of information, forget about spelling errors, corrects an important piece of information, there's always a footnote yes. or an update. Uh, you know, that, that there are notes that tell the viewer, uh, reader, that this is what we've updated, we got this wrong. I remember that The Guardian practically invented this practice. Mm -hmm. And it stood alarmingly exposed to me that they conspicuously decided not 
to mention these mm. updates which was very weird i've actually written to a bunch of friends in in the guardian i still have friends in the guardian ask them this is weird oh. because i've seen the smallest of correction and, and updates being uh, uh, you know being uh, mentioned in your correction footnotes so how how come this didn't happen and i have i haven't got a satisfactory response from any of them mm. because uh, uh, and and that that's a, that for me is like a big big alarm bell uh, because it suggests that there's more to this piece than just you know journalistic impulse now it's very easy whenever there's a there's a story that could potentially embarrass india or could potentially uh, you know quote unquote get india into trouble or put the spotlight on india in an unsavory manner when it comes out there there is one section in this country which will say hatchet job agenda piece hai election ke pehle kar diya ye sab the paradox is that a piece like this you know uh, and again not to be facetious is that uh, people don't know whether to celebrate what is being said in this article yes. or be embarrassed by it you know there are so many paradoxes in this thing you know a huge section uh, you know will say that this is fabulous you're basically affirming that the research and analysis wing has successfully carried out a, a you know a, a very very efficient assassination program of india's enemies these are people that are designated as terrorists by the world's largest democracy yeah. what more do you want kitna aur death warrant chahiye in logon ko par to the guardian's credit and this is actually something that i was very pleased about uh, dev is that all of the people that they're talking about in this article by hana uh, are described as terrorists yes you know so it's it's a little funny it's a little absurd they're talking about oh my god india has been sending these terrible death squads and uh, you know there's a sleeper cell operating out of united arab emirates and they've been employing pakistanis to carry out their dirty work and bump off who terrorists you know you don't even say you know citizens or locals or militants or operatives or any of the other beautiful british euphemisms that they use for enemies that are not theirs uh, but in this particular case i love how they call them terrorists so uh, so obviously at multiple levels someone was not having a very good day at the guardian uh, because uh, a they call them terrorists then they say it's wrong to kill them then uh, there are no on record uh, voices in this entire story not a single one not even an expert usually uh, an another style sheet point in such a piece is uh, by and large if you look at the bbc the guardian independent etc if you have a piece about covert operations uh, you know espionage intelligence agencies very difficult to you, for you to have a, an on record sound bite or a quote because nobody is going to be on the record it's it's an anon it's an anonymous world and that that's okay but you will always have some on record expert view a veteran a former espionage person an intelligence analyst or something of that kind kind of commenting on the whole thing and giving a sense of whether this looks to be true or not that is also absent from this piece so from beginning to end it's all here say he said she said uh, an intelligence operative said this and an isi guy said this and a raw guy said this and somebody else said this so so there's nothing to really hold on to mm. my last point about the guardian piece is and again this is not to blow anyone's trumpet which is that virtually every uh, you know killing that is described in the guardian piece has already been reported mm. all of those have been reported including several of them by india today's uh, you know crime bureau chief arvind oja uh, so so none of those are re revelatory uh, you know many of them are the so called unknown gunmen incidents so what the guardian piece uh, actually seeks to do Uh, i'm still baffled by hmm. because anyone who looks at it uh, with even a remote amount of interest will say ye to pata tha ye to already pata tha isn't this already reported unknown gunmen ye wo and all that acha now they're linking it to india but you know see people are not people are not stupid also right the, the the thing is there can only be two possibilities if terrorists are dying in pakistan there can only be two uh, possibilities one that raw is indeed carrying out a fabulous assassination program yeah. of its terrorists abroad Uh, in which case kudos to raw and you know salute to all operatives involved in this world and nobody needs to take my word seriously because how can i prove any such thing and point number 2 given that pakistan has spawned so many terrorist organizations uh, you know on its soil uh, it's come to a point where these uh, the, and we said this in our last episode yes. as well dev that all these uh, terror organizations are now competing for 
uh, you know, shrinking resources and they're bumping each other off. And therefore, this kind of thing can also be seen as a possibility. So I, the, the Guardian piece actually didn't really achieve yep. very much. Uh, I, I, I saw the external affairs ministry reacting, saying false and malicious and falsehoods, etc. I found that a, a bit of an overreaction. Because, because in my view, the Guardian piece uh, was a, it kind of spoke for itself how mm. poorly it was put together. Yeah, true. Uh, the last two points you made actually kind of captured the gist of uh, the episode on unknown gunmen that we did uh, a, few, a few weeks ago. So again, uh, the link will be there in the show notes. And also we discussed the fact of how the world of espionage, the world of spying is very murky. It's yeah. dirty. And uh, you cannot look at it at black and, as in black and white. Uh, you know, one of the things the Guardian report said as though that was some sort of an accusation uh, was that <laughs> the raw got inspired from the Mossad and the KGB. I was like, huh, to? Like Matlab, that's a criticism. Yeah, <laughs> that's what intel agencies do. I mean, you see some other agent intelligence which is very good at its job. You'll obviously yeah. take inspiration from it, right? I mean, Speaking of us, if you see some other journalist, other defense uh, journalist who's do, uh, in your view is doing a much better job than you, you'd obviously take some notes. So, what can I do? I can right? tell you, I can tell you, Dev, that the comparison with Mossad has gladdened the hearts of, of the course. intelligence community because uh, you know, even though Israel is having a uh, not a particularly good year as mm. far as Mossad's yeah. reputation is concerned, uh, any comparisons with Mo Mossad are only to be welcomed. Because of their, you know, fearsome reputation for retribution and, uh, you know, being alert and actually being able to conduct these garme guske marna type attacks and stuff. So I can tell you that uh, uh, if if the if the if the purpose of such a piece was to somehow embarrass India mm. or uh, you know put the harsh glare of the public spotlight on India and make it look bad, it has it has spectacularly failed because because. Uh, what is the purpose of such a thing? Let's explore the two the two possible purposes of putting this kind of a spotlight on India. Okay, we've discussed threadbare how this Guardian piece is 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 terribly shoddy. It's very mm -hmm. amateurish kind of piece. Now, now let's talk about what the purpose could be. Okay, l l l let us assume that there is a purpose. First of all, uh, a it could be to embarrass India politically before the elections, the the ruling government. I mean, or it could be more likely to embarrass India diplomatically because it because it kind of makes India look or the attempt is to make India look ham-handed and foolish and stuff. We have to look also at the background of what has happened last year. Uh, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of uh, Canada, made an attempt to make India look like a villainous aggressor coming into Canada and killing a terrorist like Hardeep Singh Nijjar. Now, that whole thing has fallen flat on its face because, because Trudeau has gotten terribly and embarrassingly entangled in a, in a kind of gangster war. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he, he doesn't know what he's got himself into. The Sikhs are also pissed off with him. The Khalistanis are also pissed off with him now. And, so, and, and the Indians, of course, are terribly pissed off with him. So he, he's, he's kind of isolated and lonely right now. And he's definitely not going to be the Prime Minister of Canada for very long. If you go to the United States now, everybody says, Canada, though, okay, but United States is a very mamla hai. You know, when United States says something, you know, then we have to take it seriously. And even the Indian government had said, you know, we, we react differently to Canada and the United States. But I have a bit of an objection even there before I come to the point about the Guardian piece, Dev. Even with the United States, where do we look bad? The Gurpatwan Singh Pannu episode... The only thing that has come out from the case filed in the United States is some dodgy character of Indian origin sitting somewhere in Czech Republic. Mm. Beyond the case that was filed in a New York district court, nothing else has come out after that. Whether this was a point to be proven by Biden or not, we've discussed it in a previous episode, but we don't know if that was a point. But how come it hasn't moved further? In the minds of most people, diplomatically and otherwise, the residue of that entire issue is that, why is the United States protecting a guy that yeah. India calls a terrorist. A country like India that has no record of, of harming other countries, a country that has designated that guy using all international rule books, including the UN, Interpol, whatever it is, designated that guy a terrorist. Why is the United States trying to embarrass India and protect that guy, saying he's a citizen, etc.? Now this Guardian piece comes in light of all that, saying that, oh, US and Canada have tried to embarrass us. Let's also try and embarrass India. What does it make India look like? You know, you'll have one liberal, pseudo-liberal ecosystem in India saying that, see, 
we can't even do covert operations properly these were the same people same complainers who were saying why can't india go out and do something and protect our people abroad and you know kill our enemies we talk so much about all this but we never do anything when you do it and then these diplomatic entanglements come in because of you know ulterior motives of countries like pakistan and canada then you say oh my god you can't even kill our enemies without being caught and shamed in this manner you have to understand what the message is the message is that when you when a country decides to be decisive internationally when it decides not to any longer be closeted by its domestic issues when a country like india has decided and, I, and and i'm not saying this in a kind of bharat mata ki jai way at all at all zero last person to say that when a country decides that countries like pakistan countries like canada are never going to act on our dossiers they are never going to act on our evidence of terrorists on their soil then countries like india to protect our interests to protect the path that we have taken to growth etc we have to settle business with our own enemies we have to take matters into our own hands and that is where this ghar ghar mein ghuske marna issue comes in now i don't think modi was talking about the guardian piece okay because uh, connecting those two things would be difficult obviously he was talking about uri and balakot etc yes. but i'm sure there's a bit of a mischievous of course. you know maybe i could have been talking about that also because because see perceptionally in terms of narrative we'll go into the technicals of uh, how, how difficult something like this could be and which we have in the last episode but in terms of perception because nobody is ever going to have any black and white evidence of any of this stuff so it it's pointless ever thinking oh did we do it did we not do it that's pointless the only thing we have left in our hands is the perception of whether we did or not mm. now that perception of whether india did these things is it beneficial to us or is it not beneficial to us in an area where it is not beneficial to us it is in the diplomatic sphere but in in diplomatic transactions you need hard evidence and proof to prove that india did these things in an era in an arena where uh, uh, evidence does not matter only perception matters is political and such a thing is only beneficial to the ruling government because it makes it look strong mazboot neta mazboot uh, mulk all this stuff gets underscored by stories like this so which is why i'm completely baffled as to what the purpose of the guardian piece was because it has achieved frankly nothing as far as i'm concerned all uh, right uh, so you know uh, the this sort of urge of politicians to kind of own up to the piece without actually formally owning up especially when these of uh, this uh, p- politicians are people with uh, in power you know people like rajnath singh who was a minister of defense who by the way was asked about the guardian piece in an interview to which he well did not reply to the piece per se but he said ki in case if there's a terrorist who comes here attacks us and then run the way to pakistan of course ghar mein jaake ghar mein guske marenge which the guardian by the way mistook as confirmation yeah. i think they ran a piece saying ki rajnath singh has confirmed yeah, the yeah. piece by saying this he did which not is, confirm which is which is only piece. the yeah. latest of their yeah exactly uh, stupidities yes uh, but that did provoke a thought uh, for me is that uh, would you uh, or do you think uh, uh, that politicians should be a bit mindful about uh, commenting uh, on such topics when they're talking to a domestic audience i'll also take up the example of pm modi's comment in 2020 uh, he was i forgot where but he was addressing a group of uh, soldiers al- uh, near the LC somewhere uh, and there i think he had said something on the lines of ki china never has and did not and has not intruded into indian territory now it caused a controversy the pmo had to issue a clarification yeah, the yeah. day later that what he meant was he was talking about some specific spots especially with respect to the galwan valley clash incident and not the entire lsk because that was, the comment was mistaken as him saying that china has never intruded into indian territory ever which what the pmo said is not yeah, what he yeah. what he what he meant uh do you think such comments then diplomatically can create issues for india and that's why politicians should perhaps why the not celebrate such uh, uh, incidents or such events too much uh, when talking to the domestic no, audiences no uh, you know if we're talking about the uh, the the uri's uh, you know trans border strikes or the trans loc strikes or the or the balakot strikes dev uh, you know though a decision was taken by the bjp government political a political decision was taken to publicize them and to celebrate them uh, it was it was not it didn't happen by chance it's not like ki kisi ko pata chal gaya tha newspaper mein aa gaya tha uske baad you know jashan shuru ho gaya tha it was not like that the 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 uri surgical strikes was announced in a press conference the balakot air strikes was revealed you know officially by the by the government so so there was no question of uh, you know uh, those things being impromptu those were those were sort of structured planned 
announcements and celebrations now when we talk about when we talk about uh, uri and uh, balakot the government went to town on those Th- that's become a separate political issue about how can you politicize attacks mm. and th- stif- stuff like that oh, balakot is the reason why the bjp government won in 2019 let's not go into all those but i i have a i have a different take on you know the politicization of military operations and stuff and i i personally don't think it's very tasteful but but the the metaphor of ghar mein ghuske maarna is a very powerful one and the and i i uh, forget, let, let's not get into whether it's right or wrong i'm not surprised that the bjp has latched on to it in such a big way the modi government has latched on to it in such such a big way because uh, it in many ways is trying to own the fact that it is this government that changed the paradigm of revenge attacks mm. uh, you know there was no longer uh, uh, you know the concept of waiting until we'll decide how to hit back it was creating a certain template for retribution uh, that the, that this government in its wisdom or in its lack of wisdom that only f- the history will tell uh, was to make pakistan sleepless make pakistan eternally nervous and uh, give pakistan constant pause about what its next attack will be like because if it does that then you will have an uri or a balakot so you choose whether you want to harm india again now uri and balakot are very different from the kind of things that the guardian piece is is uh, suggesting that india carries out uri and balakot are being trumpeted from the rooftops those are those are being officially acknowledged the world would perhaps not have even known about them if the modi government had not announced them right but the 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 alleged assassination program of the research and analysis wing and uh, uh, you know and uh, you can ask me this after this uh, when i give you a bit of a nugget on this uh uh dev is that is that on such issues obviously care has to be taken because because covert operations are uh classified uh they are uh, sensitive talking about them can have a uh, can have a backlash effect diplomatically uh it can affect uh, uh it, it can actually affect national security issues on the ground in certain locations it can alert another country towards what you intend to do etc so so uh i haven't i personally haven't seen any minister or government official sort of jumping around and trumpeting what the guardian piece has suggested or the you know or any other piece has suggested in terms of the raw assassination program is concerned that is that that kind of jashan that kind of celebration has been confined to twitter and instagram mm. and you know that kind of celebration where it doesn't really matter that's your surround sound you know you 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 can call it the it cell you can call it what you want but that is not official government celebration of an assassination program but uh, uh, which brings me back to the, the the kind of we we started off talking about the care that needs to be taken by by by, uh, by government and ministers but let's not forget that the the the, the kind of aura of Uh, aura of uh, uh, you know of decisiveness mm. this aura of uh, fearlessly going into an enemy country and quietly bumping off 20 guys uh, is who do, it it only benefits the government it only benefits these ministers who are choosing not to talk and must be careful about talking about these things so whether they talk about it or not it's going to benefit them because people looking at it saying wow finally we have a country that's settling scores finally we have a country that's not being reluctant about chasing people across the border and killing them you know these are these are uh, these are not uh, you know technical issues for most people most people are not uh, Uh, you know uh, fully immersed in the intricacies of uh, the intersection between military operations and diplomacy and espionage and things like that these are people saying these are pakistani terrorists they harmed us you know i know people who've been harmed in terror attacks and we've gone and killed them that's that that it's as simple as that that is the perception so we need to differentiate completely between Ga- balakot uri and what the guardian piece is trying to allege right now all right uh, we'll uh, move to the surgical strikes i mean that actually was uh, a topic that has been demanded by several of our readers and uh, and uh, viewers for us to discuss and we were going to do it on a future episode but this i think we gave us a nice peg so we'll do that but after a quick break what was re- irking me was the kind of reactions that a section of social media put that day saying that okay we have lost the world cup if kohli plays so what mm-hmm. yes okay. what is this what is this what kind of assessment is that kohli is not going to play with a team that has patidar uh, anuj rawat mahi pal mahi pal exactly. for all that yeah for all that he has done he is not an established cricketer he is not proven himself at the highest level consistently he is going to bat with surya kumar yadav hardik pandya rinkut singh to follow him 
right? So that approach, and if you see that one match he played against Afghanistan, he did not have to do it, but he he scored at a quick pace. He is gonna mm-hmm. be a power play basher. Mm-hmm. I am not averse to the idea. As in, you might you both might not agree. I am not averse to the idea of playing Rohit and Kohli at the top to maximize someone like no, Samson no, as a pure no, batter. No, 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 no. I, I, don't, agree. I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. that. I, that is that is as Kohli wrong has as to bat at number three. Welcome back. Uh, Shiv and I are discussing a recent report uh, by the British newspaper, The Guardian, uh, which has caught, caused quite the uh, controversy on social media. The report alleges that the raw in the Indian spy agency operates a squad of hitmen uh, based out of the UAE that's been going around killing terrorists in Pakistan. Uh, I actually now want to move back to 2016 and uh, when unknown gunmen actually ghar mein guske mara or ghar mein per se because it was in POK which is uh, Indian territory and mm. they're not really unknown. I mean people like Shiv know who they are, uh, people in the top brass of the military know who they are but people, civilians like you and I as in the uh, listeners and I, we don't know their names. Uh, we know the name Major Mike Tango yeah. as yeah. he was called in your, in your book uh, India's Most Fearless. This is your first book I think. Yeah. The one that had the, the first ever account of the surgical strikes. Uh, before we talk about the implications, the politics because even this became a, a quite uh, political Shiv, based on your conversations with Major Mike Tango and the others, can you just like give us a picture of what those strikes were actually like? So, so these uh, strikes, uh, you know, were were uh, you know we call them surgical strikes now in 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 uh, in um, warfare terminology. A surgical strike is usually an air strike. So, so right off the bat, controversially, let me say this, the word surgical strike doesn't really fit this kind of thing. It was a transporter strike or a uh, you know, the, the, or a you know, transporter raid, as it were, because the 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 total duration of what we now know as the Uri strikes, uh, you know, was a few hours. Uh, it, it, it it didn't last for more time than that. Uh, what fewer people know is that uh, that even though even though the actual attack took, uh, you know, just a couple of hours. Uh, the 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 unknown gunmen as they were I, I know who they are and uh, you know many people have made correct guesses on the internet about who they were they were uh, they were all from the four para special forces yes. uh, uh, of the Indian Army uh, but these were men who um, basically went across uh, at three different locations of the LOC uh, into Pakistan occupied Kashmir like you rightly said uh, spent a night there so, you know w- waited waited for many hours during the night. Uh, continued to get coordinates of uh, their target zones etc and then conducted a, a a truly fearsome attack the attack obviously was a, a retributive strike after the uri uri attack the uri attack on the uri army camp uh, in which several people were killed uh, and uh, this attack this attack uh, uh, the the uri surgical strike the retaliatory attack took place just a few days after uh, uri and um, it was a deeply successful strike because it was um, planned and executed in a very, very short time. Uh, the targets were, uh, these were some of the first targets that were uh, corroborated using uh, raw human intelligence on the ground. Uh, uh, you know, most people think, uh, uh, you know, now with the Guardian piece, of course, uh, Raw's reputation is sky high. But but even at that time, Raw, you know, Raw has always enjoyed having a kind of middling kind of reputation ki achhe ki nahi hai yaar because we never hear about exactly. anything that they do now you're hearing so much of what they do and people are like is this all true is it not true what is it you know so your know, comparisons with mossad and all that so raw is not used to this raw raw has always cruised along very happy having a kind of middle of the road reputation mm. ki ha some things we've heard of that they did but mostly kuch karte nahi hai so they're fine with that because obviously it's not true at all they're doing everything very very quietly the the quieter you do it yes. you know the, the less okay. people know about what you're doing the greater your uh, real job so raw fa- is absolutely doing a fabulous job uh, now now uh, the uri strikes uh, tested many things for the first time mm. the use of drones uh, you know, to 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 uh, to to locate coordinates and and uh, and uh, you know finalize them for the attacks. The use of human intelligence wasn't done for the first time, obviously, but this was a new set of assets that that the raw had been able to uh, you know cultivate in POK uh, and were being used for the first time for this purpose. These were these were these were villagers in those places who were being used in order to go and actually check those launch pad areas to check how many terrorists were there. Were they worth attacking? Because if there was no one there, there was, what's the point? These were people who actually confirmed that there were lots of people in these target areas. So yes, it's worth attacking. That's why 38 terrorists were finally killed 
uh in in you know it, it, during that night so uh, this was a this was a lightning fast operation and one of india's most successful operations because uh there was not a single indian casualty mm. uh there was one per, there was one man who was injured by a mine blast on his way back during the recovery but uh, otherwise it was a picture perfect operation right uh good point you made about uh, not being a single indian casualty because i think in a previous episode you talked about how when such operations are planned the army also draws up what is known as an what what's their acceptable uh, yeah. limit for damage i mean so there would be a number ki okay if you are sending let's say 40 troops across we are okay uh, or we'll call this a success even if let's say x number of them return unfortunately right. uh, dead yeah. so uh, coming back yeah, and i uh, i remember reading a book and uh, major mike tango he describes how the return was the most fearsome one because uh, when uh, the, during the attack i mean they caught the pakistani military off guard but when they were coming back obviously everyone was on a high alert yeah. and they knew they were being hunted uh, yet to be able to you know come back and and make 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 it make it home that like, gives you a good perspective Absolutely. of what the paras yeah. can do uh before the politics of it a uh, slight aside uh, with both uh, uri uh, and the balakot air strike uh, both were attributive uh, both happened after uh, major terrorist attacks uh, the uri attack like you said i think killed around 19 indian soldiers uh, the the pulwama. attack uh, the pulwama attack uh, killed 40 crpf yeah. uh, men uh, i've always wondered why have we not heard much about what actually led to those attack in the first place because both of them were massive massive intel and security failures huge yeah. you had a shit ton of explosives rdx in jammu and kashmir for that massive blast to happen we've seen i mean shiv and i have seen those pictures yeah. pictures that we've with no media houses published because those pictures cannot be published but for that kind of an explosion to happen you need a lot of explosives similarly the uri attack was in an army camp it yeah. was not a it was not a random bomb grenade or so some small uh, tiffin cooker blast somewhere it was in an army camp where 19 soldiers died and they were sleeping when the attack happened if i'm not wrong yes, uh so we've not heard i mean i'm pretty sure investigations have happened i'm pretty sure you've had access to people who've done those investigations you've had access to the probe other reports that have been made after the investigations but why have we not heard much about what failure led to those attacks in the first place no there there's no question dev that uh, both uri and uh, Bal- uh, the the pulwama Pulwam. attacks were both uh, colossal intelligence failures uh now uh they're also the subject matter of a great deal of politics obviously uh, you know many people have said a lot of things about both uri and mm. the pulwama attacks i won't go into that uh but speaking very technically they were colossal i mean unforgivably large intelligence failures uh, uh uri a little bit less so the reason is because <clears throat> the uri attack was conducted by uh, i think three three or four, three or four terrorists yeah. who had crept across the a line of control had spent a few nights you know in the hidden areas hinterland forests and stuff uh, and then attacked uh, uri the uri camp by night uh, they obviously were fully aware of the gaps uh, the fact that the jawans would be sleeping where the sentries were uh, you know where the oil drums were they used the oil drums to you know cause a huge fire in the in in the camp that's where most of the casualties happened while the jawans were sleeping like you rightly said uh, so it was a Uh, that that was a terrible attack there was no there was no question about it but uh, it can be it can be uh, in some ways understood in terms of the modus operandi of uh, you know jaish e mohammed slash lashkar e taiba terrorists and they are capable of doing such things the balakot uh, the the pulwama attack is uh, is is far less understandable mm. uh, because here you had a local from uh, from pulwama uh who uh, who uh, had uh, an enormous quantity of rdx uh, in a car uh, in a part of the country where where intelligence is always at a maximum level uh in terms of supply in terms of transfer in terms of uh, you know where rdx is procured uh, in terms of bomb making uh the indian armies and the indian intelligence forces have a a very formidable intelligence network especially in in places like south kashmir mm. which pulwama is a part of uh so for for this to have happened there uh is 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 beyond the realms of understanding i'm not saying it's not imp- it's not it's it's impossible of course intelligence failures can happen but for it to happen in pulwama at a time uh you know before elections uh at a time before uh, uh, you know at a time when security is generally at its maximum levels um you know at a time when 
you've already got alarm bells, uh, you know, blazing post Pathan Court, post Uri, etc. That Pakistan is going to be trying to do something, uh, and that uh, you know it could come from the inside. There was specific intelligence that internal cells could be activated for the biggest possible attack before the elections. Uh, you know, led to the, led to what happened in Pulwama. Uh, you had you had protocol breakdowns in terms of. Uh, uh, you know the 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 road clearing operations for the CRPF convoy. Uh, you had intelligence failures in terms of uh, you know the barricades and the barriers. Uh, you know that 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 led to the highway from the villages where this car actually came from. Uh, so so there were there were multi level multi level failures. Uh, the 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 polit the political side of it, of course, is that. Uh, that this was a stage managed attack before the elections to create a mood of terror, uh, to necessitate the Bala Balakot yes, attacks and give the Modi government an opportunity to look and flex muscle against Pakistan. Now, that's the politics of it. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, I'm actually, a, I, I'm a cynic and a skeptic and I, I don't believe anything is beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, but forget about the politics for a moment because in Pulwama, for something like this to even happen uh, would require a kind of stage managing that took into account intelligence agencies, locals, the army, the CRPF, uh, the, the local military intelligence units, uh, the civilian agencies, the police, the truckers, the traffic cops, all these agencies together. Are you telling me that you can stage manage something where all of these agencies fail uh, in a beautiful symphony at the same time, allowing to, a car to go and you know blow up uh, how, however many kilograms of RDX at a particular point, at a particular time that extracts maximum damage from that convoy. Uh, again, theoretically, it's possible. Mm. Is it probable? Highly improbable, is, is all I'm going to say. Uh, so, so there is no question that an intelligence failure happened. Uh, uh, and we still don't know the full reality or the truth about where that RDX came from, who transported it, how did the intelligence agencies miss it, was that RDX from inside or outside India? None of those questions still have answers. Uh, I have seen reports that are still inconclusive as far as wow. Pulwama concerned. Yeah, that is quite yep. uh, surprising, and I'm frankly quite surprised by that. Yeah, because we should have had some answers by now. Correct. Not all. We don't. And that is quite uh, unfortunate and sad, I think, uh, when it comes to that particular rat attack. Uh, uh, last uh, sort of a thought as we uh, bring this episode to a close uh, with respect to the surgical strike, because I'll avoid Balokot because surgical strike was the first, you know, like you said, it was announced. Uh, the UPA Congress always say ki there's nothing new in this. Hamara time pe bhi hota tha. Uh, I know uh, I've spoken to people like you, journalists have also said ki yeah, it's a fact hota tha. In fact, just a year before, there was a huge surgical stri strike across the border in the Northeast uh, where the army chased down, I think, around a group of the NSCN, if yeah. I'm not wrong, which had ambushed uh, an army patrol uh, a few days before. So they went into Myanmar and... Uh, took out their uh, hideouts, etc. That also was quite, quite, quite the operation. Uh... But I think, you know, when uh, the Congress says that our time maybe hota tha, this is nothing new, this is just grandstanding, etc. I think they're kind of missing with the woods for the trees because uh, I think, uh, and that's when I want your thoughts on, on uh, I think that mm, perhaps a surgical strike is a tactical operation. Maybe the Uri strike was because the uh, because militaries, by the way, live by the philosophy an eye for an eye. If yeah. you come and hit us, we're going to hit you back. That's, that's it. Right. Yeah. So if an attack happens, like the Uri attack, the army was going to respond. Uh, so maybe the response at the strike level was tactical but having your DGMO to hold a press conference the next day and announcing it to the world formally that was a strategic move right. that was formal acknowledgement that yes we have done this this was not a it was not like the local commander who is in Pakistan he knows that this is what has happened this is the entire country has been told Correct. bro this is what yeah. we've done right uh, which also explains the fact that why uh, after the strikes, the Uri strikes, uh, it was the DGM or the army that announced, uh, made the announcement. And why after the Bala Kodai strike, it was the MEA that made the announcement because the the strike happened uh, in uh, in POK, Pakistan Occupied Kashmir, which is Indian territory, while the Bala Kodai strike happened in actual Pakistani yeah, territory. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, your thoughts on this. Do you think... Uh, yeah, okay, strikes were first, but making that announcement was what uh, mattered at the end of the day. No, you're, you're absolutely right. What you said right at the uh, opening uh, of this question is, is exactly what the answer to that question is, which is that this was tactical action with a very premeditated uh, intention to have a strategic effect. Because uh, 
in in uh, under no circumstances under no circumstances dev is uh, you know killing a killing 20 30 40 terrorists uh, going to put an end to terrorism in pakistan mm. uh, at at uh, uh, under no circumstances is killing 100 200 300 terrorists as india or the indian air force claimed in balakot going to put an end to terror terrorism from pakistan because uh, like you know that's it's like an akshay patra of terrorism pakistan uh, the more you kill the more will emerge from those villages so uh, there's there, there, you, you can't kill a few terrorists and expect terrorism to stop but the effect that both uri and balakot have had uh, is being felt even today it's being felt even today the the strategic effect of uh, what india did in uri and balakot uh is hugely hugely more potent than what happened on those days because the 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 sense of trepidation the sense of uh uncertainty the sense of uh nervousness the sense of unpredictability that india has imposed on pakistan which doesn't know when the next attack is going to come from uh is 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 you can't put a price on that what you've basically done is uh forced pakistan to never sleep to constantly be on a on an expensive and exhausting state of maximum alert uh uh it can't even carry out its uh, bread and butter terrorism anymore without expecting some kind of big response from india you know chota mota loc transgression bhi nahi kar sakte aajkal you know it's it's become that kind of situation so this is this is not your 56 56 inch chest and rambo and all forget all those things that you know leave that to the politicians what the army and the air force have basically done is impose a psychosis on pakistan which tells them that no matter what you do you won't be able to rest anymore or your rest has come down drastically and now remember that when we say that pakistan has to be on maximum alert for a military and a system to be on maximum and in, system and military are indistinguishable in pakistan mm. when you impose the the uh, the uh, that they have to be on maximum alert all the time it's extremely expensive it's a huge impact on their economy it's a huge impact on 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 their uh, uh, you know on on their uh, uh, human power because it means having to employ more people longer shifts uh you know more maintenance for radars and missiles and tanks and whatever your entire uh, hardware machinery and arsenal needs to be constantly on war alert all the time expensive proposition so you're basically your the strategic effect of your one act in september 2016 or in uh, in um, uh, february uh, 2019 right. uh you know resonates even now the the cost of that is being borne even now by a pakistan that says damn you know our attacks resulted in this so we have no idea what the threshold is hmm. we don't know nuclear to chodo but uske uske niche bhi kar rahe hain humko they coming after us even below that they've they, they've they've made it clear to the world that the nuclear ladder means nothing between india and pakistan and they've made us look like fools because even for a small three, we sent four people to attack an army camp and they came and like 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 obliterated 40 of us hmm. so we don't know what these guys are going to do they're very unpredictable and especially before elections they're unpre- even more un- unpredictable but that's the politics of it but uh, yeah so the the strategic effect of these actions is is undeniable is absolutely undeniable i mean it's it's everywhere you look hmm. even the guardian piece in my view is in some ways symptomatic of this uh, psychosis yep. that is that everything has happened our roy agent roy agent roy agent roy agent i'm i'm surprised they're not saying modi <laughs> you know for 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 some random guy dying in khyber pakhtunkhwa yeah. saying nahi modi ne kiya but but the point is that this 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 psychosis is was the intended effect hmm. which is why people which is why when politicians say sabood dikhao ki kitne log mare gaye uri mein and stuff it's so silly yeah. it's it it doesn't even understand the thing oh, did the bombs really penetrate that building in balakot and kill so many people it just does not it, it doesn't get the point That's the point is lost exactly. in that yes. and for how many days did that become a political issue sabood do ki kitne log mare gaye wo jaba top pe photos nahi hai kisi koi wahan gaya nahi hai and all that stuff absolutely pointless because pakistan got the message yeah. so 
you know that's the point uh, right uh, so one uh, last tidbit from usb in this episode uh, just some the same same lines uh, so yeah strikes like that have, have had happened before i'm pretty sure post 2016 uh, other such strikes would have happened is there some sort of like you know jealousy envy within the military units ki bhai hum bhi to karte hain unko publicity mil gaya like no one knows any obviously uh, but unko publicity mil gaya everyone talks about 2016 but hum bhi to yaar karte hain no no, no. Like so, so so look uh, first we've got to differentiate between what happened in uri and other uh, Uh, strikes you're right that strikes do happen the uri strike was special because it came after a particularly large terror attack mm-hmm. b it was uh, not a shallow strike it was a deep strike uh, up to 6 kilometers inside pok which is a, 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 a large distance for a commando attack mm-hmm. uh, okay the kind of attacks that happen at the tactical level between un- units because you're right you know it's an eye for an eye at the tactical level uh you know you don't mess with my unit you 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 hit somebody from your side on my unit i'm sending someone after you okay i for an eye is how it works that's the, the, the those are the old jungle rules of the line of control but uh uri was different it was a strategic attack it was a tactical operation with a strategic effect uh but uh, the, the the four para special forces was not the only uh unit that was involved with it uh there was a jat regiment unit a regular jat regiment unit there were a couple of rashtra rifles units also that provided backup mm. uh, etc for the for the overall operation uh so uh so that's there but uh in terms of jealousy i i don't think there's you know jealousy as such there there's a great deal of admiration mm. uh, you know the four para have uh, you know sort of acquitted themselves commendably across units whether it's the keran operation Uh, whether it is the uh, randori behek operation at the beginning of the pandemic uh, uh, this one and so many others so uh, i don't know if it's about jealousy there 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 probably is a bit of healthy competition and i can tell you that within the para special forces they do keep a body count oh, on their hands okay. they do keep a body count they, they you've got to keep that they, 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 that's what ultimately will fuel you right yeah. it's it, it it's about protecting your country uh, and uh, you know this is ultimately a hunt these guys are hunters so yeah. you can't expect them to uh, you know shun things like body counts and things like that yeah right uh, good i will end this episode on that note uh, thanks shiv a uh, great insights wonderful uh, chat with you uh, and one of the must uh, i think this was a topic that was asked by the most number of uh, uh, readers and viewers yeah. every i think episode i'd see a comment on youtube keep please talk about surgical strike so i hope uh, we we've done justice to that and if you have any other ideas if you have any other topics f- please feel free uh, drop us a comment on 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 youtube if you're watching us on youtube if you're listening us to on apple podcast or spotify you can whatsapp us at 8 5 late 966696 thanks as always to our producer ana priyadarshini and thanks to our listeners and viewers once again for the award that we won it's all because of you that's it for this week's defense dose for more tune in next week till then stay safe and do not cross any boundaries with your passport bye bye